of gum. Hi everybody, I'm Megan Moran from Bill's Mom, all of like my baby's mom. That's me. Thanks to my two pregnant moms, but that's probably more about her than for women, because frankly, it's really, really poor. Um, so thanks for being here. I'm going to pass it over to Sue Latoja, who works with uh, Advocate or Health and Community Outreach to help bring these fantastic programs to the library. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming in from the rain too. It's been pouring and lightning and then it's and then rain, no snow. <laughs> we are very privileged to have Dr. Rashmi Rabbit here with us tonight. And she's board certified in cardiology, advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology, echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, cardiac computer tomography, and internal medicine. She was educated at the Cardiovascular Fellowship. She completed her Cardiovascular Fellowship at Advocates Illinois Masonic Medical Center. Internal medicine re residency was completed at University of Illinois at Chicago and at Advocates Christ Medical Center. And her Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery obtained from Tempagata Institute of Medicine. And we are very, like I said, very privileged to know the research is very passionate about women in emergency medicine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so for that kind introduction, and thanks to the book on my very brain program. Um, I'm going to try to do my best using the mind and the I did answer, so bear with me here. I can get it right at the get go. Worked. Okay, so the objectives of this program are just to learn about what is unique about heart disease in women. And um, we're going to kind of walk through a woman's lifetime, whether it's pregnancy, premenopausal years, and menopause, and then we'll go to the postmenopausal years. And what happens to us that is unique? Um, we'll walk through the traditional cardiovascular risks some common treatments, and other cardiovascular conditions that predominate in women, and atrial fibrillation we will touch upon very briefly. So let's define the problem first. And why are we talking about this? And what, is, what is different about uh, women and heart disease? The first thing is that heart disease kills about one in three women, and almost one woman every minute, and yet, we as women don't realize and recognize that that is our biggest risk. And I'd like to bring your attention to the slide. This is actually published uh, by the American Heart Association, and these are statistics from 2021, the most recent statistics that we have available. But what I want to point, to point out is that every, every um, ethnicity, whether it's, um, it's white, black, Hispanic, or Asian females, look at cardiovascular diseases. It is what causes the maximum deaths in women. Look at breast cancer, all cancers, not even just breast cancer. All cancers follow, and that and breast cancer is probably a small portion of this. But as women, I say this all the time, I say this to all my patients, I say, I think women are more aware of their breast cancer risk than they're aware of their heart disease risk. And, and that is something that we really need to work on. So um, on the right-hand side, we see the traditional risk factors for heart disease. These are the risk factors that typically set in in a woman but right around menopause or after menopause, although nowadays we see that several of these set in earlier, but these are the traditional risk factors. Um, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, obesity, uh, inactivity, family heart disease, and then you have menopause that causes several cha changes within our bodies that actually accelerate that process. Now, if you look at emerging risk factors, these are risk factors that we're just now starting to recognize. And you'll notice uh, lupus, adverse pregnancy outcomes is a big one, and I'll touch upon that in just a little bit. 
Gestational diabetes, which is diabetes that says in pregnancy, high blood pressure in pregnancy, early menopause, polycystic ovarian disease and endometriosis, depression and cancer chemotherapy. And Thank you. Um, and on top of that, we have the social determinants of health, like race and ethnicity, education, zip codes even that play a role in outcomes. Central to this whole process is one theme, and that theme is inflammation. And you might ask, what, what does inflammation have to do with this? And this is inflammation, not, not only just the body level, but in the, at the endothelial level. What is the endothelium? The endothelium is the lining of the blood vessel. The cells that line the blood vessel is what we refer to as the endothelium. And when there's inflammation in the endothelium, what happens is the blood vessel behaves in a manner that we do not want it to be in. So it starts malfunctioning. And that results in the process that sets off atherosclerosis, which is the process of double cholesterol in these arteries. And that leads to the vascular disease down the road. So if you look at a woman's cardiovascular risk, um, traditionally, the top of what I have up here is the traditional model, the traditional thought process that we have. And that was, here is menopause. And we said in the reproductive years and I, during perimenopause, and up and until the time of menopause, a woman's risk is low. This was the traditional thinking. And then once we had menopause and get into the postmenopausal years, is when our risk of heart disease takes off. And this has been traditionally what we've been taught and what we've taught our patients. But what we're realizing now is that there's a lot more that goes on. Thank you. So if you look here, this is where we have pregnancy that sets in and several gynecological conditions set in that might alter a woman's risk many, many, many years in the road. And then menopause sets in right about here. So this is our window to intervene early. So we have sisters, children, daughters, and yourself that, that are in this group realize that this is a time when you can intervene to do what is called primary prevention. That is, you prevent the onset of disease. What happens after this, when you get to the postmenopausal years, the standard risk factors I spoke about, hypertension, diabetes, and so on, set in, and a lot of the times, the disease process is already started in the body. So this, if we can, if we, is the time when we get the maximum bang for the buck. This is the time that we need to focus on in terms of preventing the onset of the disease. So let's talk about what happens during pregnancy that increases our risk of disease. Okay. So this was a, um, uh, a statement that was published by the American Heart Association last year. And APO is adverse pregnancy outcomes and cardiovascular risk. And I'm not sure they said that those patients who have high blood pressure during pregnancy, diabetes during pregnancy, preterm, pre small for gestational age babies, big for gestational age babies, they have other sorts of adverse outcomes during pregnancy. All of these women are actually at increased risk of developing heart disease down the street. And we were trying to understand what is central to this, what happens in all these women. And it's a complex interplay of many different things that actually causes these women to down the road to develop adverse um, outcomes from a cardiovascular standpoint. And what is it? Is there are several risk factors that are shared between these adverse pregnancy outcomes and cardiovascular disease? There's inflammation that we spoke about. And the placenta, the, the, the growth of the placenta, remember the placenta is rich in blood vessels. And it's, so a lot of these adverse pregnancy outcomes deal with abnormal vasculature in the placenta. So if you have abnormal vasculature in the placenta, down the road she happens, they end up having abnormal blood vessels. So that is sort of a marker for you to say, hey, this may be a woman who might be at risk down the road. And that and also vascular dysfunction that we discussed. And the heart in these women also maladapts to the pregnancy. And all of these put together result in downstream cardiovascular problems. So the first, in this slide, you see that the prevalence of hypertension in pregnancy is going up and up and up. 
And consequently, we realize that those patients also develop good old blood pressure down the road once they're down their pregnancy. Whereas down this downstream, they develop essential hypertension, which is the run of mill hypertension. <laughs> this is gestational diabetes, and this is, and you, as you can see, the, and it, the, the, the colored um, ashes actually uh, represent what is the prevalence of gestational uh, diabetes, which is actually easier in pregnancy, and, and the prevalence of that is what's up with each birth. So when we talk about pregnancy, pregnancy is really like a stress test, basically. It's telling you how healthy is this woman's vasculature. And it's a window to predict her risk of heart disease down the road. And so, if and you, if, when you discuss with your physicians, talk about adverse pregnancy outcomes as part of the risk assessment. So, those women who had who lost pregnancies or had high blood pressure during pregnancy, or diabetes during pregnancy, this is an important part of the discussion with your physician. The thing that we've changed in the last in the, in the last few years is that we have something called. Um, the ASKB risk score. Um, and on that guideline, it basically says that if you had an adverse outcome in pregnancy, that is a risk enhancer. And I'll go over that when we do the calculation a little bit later. And a quick word on breastfeeding. So um, breastfeeding is not just important for the baby and the recovery of the, of the mother's body from the stresses of pregnancy. But the changes that it introduces in the body, including the blood pressure, the sugar, so on and so forth, have downstream effects. So they, they, they did a really elegant study in Europe, and what they did was they looked at these older women, and they saw that those women who breastfed had about a quarter, 23% lower risk of a heart attack and a stroke and cardiovascular disease. So the, the, the benefit to get from that breastfeeding long outlives the preparable. Now let's shift gears and move to gynecological conditions that increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. The first one is endometriosis, and for those of you that are not familiar with that word, endometriosis literally means that the uterine tissue is present outside the uterus. Um, these are patients who have severe pain during menstruation, and so on and so forth. And endometriosis is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Next one. And this was actually a paper that we wrote up about uh, 20 some years ago. Um, and at that time, we noticed that women who had fibroids had a greater prevalence of hypertension than those women who did not have fibroids. And we hypothesized in this paper that there was something in common between the heart and the uterus that made these women that had fibroids go on to develop high blood pressure. And the answer is just now coming out. And we realize that, that there, there are these receptors called the angiotensin receptors that are present in the uterus and also in the heart. And therefore, when we treat um, these patients with certain types of blood pressure medications, um, it actually positively affects their fibroids. Um, so I think that's the, that's the link that we were missing when we wrote that paper about 20 years ago. PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome, polycystic ovarian disease. And these patients are also at increased risk of heart disease because um, they have obesity, systemic inflammation, and insulin resistance. And some of these also go on to create the traditional risk factors for heart disease downstream. So this was a paper that came out um, a little over a decade ago, and I, it's, it's always been um, really intriguing. We've always thought that menopause sexing and once menopause sexing, a woman's risk of heart disease increases. But this paper actually examined the converse. And what they said was that those women who have risk factors for heart disease attain menopause early. And what they're saying basically is that the changes that happen, these are women who have high blood pressure, diabetes, and so on and so forth, obesity and active, and so on and so forth. And when they studied the ovaries in these patients, they found that the little arteries, the little blood vessels, ovary were actually diseased. And because of that, these women ended up attaining menopause early. And therefore, it's really a, a problem in the vasculature. And then those women obviously went on to develop premature heart disease. So uh, heart disease risk, meaning the traditional risk factors for heart disease, actually determine the age of menopause rather than the converse. And that's what we can't express in this paper. Um, in other words, we need to start working 
on our risk factors for heart disease early. Menopause and hormone therapy, this is a discussion that I have almost on a daily basis with patients, and that is, um, should we give patients hormones? Um, there were several um, central trials that were done, and, and uh, the Women's Health Initiative and the HERS study were two of them. And we always thought, okay, if, if we're protected from heart disease until we hit menopause, how about we just start supplementing these women with hormones and say, okay, let's delay menopause, let's give them hormones, and that's and if we delay that, maybe we would delay the onset of heart disease or protect them from the risk of heart disease. But what exactly happened when they did exactly that in these two studies? They found the complete opposite. Those women who were on hormones actually had more strokes and cardiovascular events, and they had to stop the trials early. The, the trials never went on to completion. Um, so they did not show benefit in suggested terms of harm. And also, these hormones, when you, um, when you supplement them extraneously, what happens is they, they increase your risk of venous thromboembolism, which is blood clots in the veins. Um, and and it's so, so basically, the, the point being, and, and this is what I discuss every day with patients, is if, if you have unbearable menopausal symptoms, I'm, I'm not trying to be miserable, but use the, short, the smallest dose, the shortest time, talk to your gynecologist to see if you really need to use it and if there are other alternatives for you. Plant estrogens may be an option, dietary changes might help. There's several things that you can do to help with that. So assess cardiovascular risk factors, think about your family history before you make a, um, a decision on, about going on hormones, these are more symptoms, which is hot flashes and so on, and not pre menopause. Now we'll move on from pregnancy and pre menopause, menopause to the post menopausal uh, time. And this is the time when your traditional risk factors pretty much take over. And, and, and they're all listed here high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, family history, inactivity, central obesity, which is obesity, especially around the mid, mid portion of the body, insulin resistance, which also sets in when you have central obesity, diabetes, diabetic kidney disease, cholesterol problems, and so on. Most of the data that we have, all the treatments that we recommend today um, to women for heart disease are all extrapolations from studies that we've done. And, and I always say that cardiologists are learned to try to study everything, and every single supplement, every single drug has to be studied, and, and so on and so forth. But we are limited in that if you look at all the studies, we've done studies on coronary disease, on heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, and so on. But if you notice, look at even though 50% or more of our patients are female, look at the percentage of women in these trials. We never hit 50%. There's such a small percentage of women that enrolled in these trials, and now we're extrapolating these results to women. So um, point being, if there is the opportunity to participate, participate. And, um, and we have to be respectful of the fact that we do not have adequate data. But if you look, and this is this is what I was saying, if you look at the percentage of women with the disease, you'll see they exceed 40 to 50 percent across every group, but enrollment in the trials is much lower than that actual percentage. Okay, so, the, so this is patients who presented to the emergency room with chest pain. Okay, and um, and they've um, and I wanted you to focus on this last group. Every time a patient comes and sees us in the office or sees us in the emergency room and they say they have chest pain, we basically divide them into three groups. One group is what we call typical angina. When the when the person tells me I'm having chest pain and they give me a description of the pain, in my mind I categorize that pain as does this sound like angina? Angina is chest pain that comes from the heart from from um, a blockage of the arteries. The second type of pain is what we call atypical angina. Atypical angina may be, it could be, but it doesn't really sound typical. It doesn't sound like the one that I would really worry about type of pain. The third type of pain is what we call non angina pain, meaning it really sounds like it's not even cardiac pain. It's probably coming from the ribs or something else. It does not sound like cardiac pain. So that's the third subgroup. But look at that third subgroup. And um, this is men and women. So at every age group, if you look at from 35 to 45, 45 to 55, 55 to 65, 65 to 75, even when we 
we think that pain sounds completely non cardiac, does not sound like it's coming from the heart, we find that there's a much larger percentage of women who actually went on to have disease when they had angiograms or stress tests. They ended up having abnormal stress tests and angiograms even when we thought this is non cardiac pain. In other words, the history is not always reliable in the world. So we have to kind of, that's why right, it's such an inexact science. I keep saying cardiology is a treacherous business. Um, it is an inexact science. We just have to put all the data that we have together and we have to do the best we can. And, and and this is to, just to show death during hospitalization. And as you can see, as age goes up, death, death during hospitalization for heart disease is on going up. This is a, this is an old slide, but it's still holds true. We move on to stress tests now. So a number of uh, women, even some of you over here, might have undergone a stress test, um, and uh, we tend to see that women have what we, we sometimes categorize as false positive changes, not only CG changes when they walk on the treadmill. Um, sometimes they might have an abnormal stress test, and when we do an angiogram, we don't really see significant blockage that we need to treat the extent um, for angioplasty and so on. And, and one of the reasons for that is because we can only treat, as of today, the, the stenting procedures that we do or any intervention procedures that we do can only focus on the larger blood vessels. So there's a three large blood vessels that supply blood to the heart, and those are the vessels that we can actually pass to your stent. But realize that each of those are, uh, arteries are like branches of a tree. You have the big branches, and then the smaller branches, and then the even smaller branches. So the smaller and the even smaller branches could have disease, but that's disease that we cannot treat. But when we look at a stress test, the stress test tells you some total health of that vascular territory. That test is not telling us, oh, this is only in the big vessel or in the smaller vessel or in the small stress. What it's telling you is, oh, what is the sum, sum total health of blood flow in that area? So some women can have what we call a small vessel disease. And so they present with positive EG changes, and um, even though they don't have large artery disease. And, and the reason for that is because they have what we call microvascular dysfunction. In other words, the itty bitty smaller, you can see here, you see it's this big blood vessel that gives off these branches, and those divide even smaller branches and even smaller branches. And those vessels can do disease. And this is what we call microvascular angina. Um, heart failure is, is, a, is another um, realm in which we're, we're significantly different than men, in that even though we have strong hearts, women have more heart failure. So realize that I have patients that ask me all the time, well, um, I have this ejection fraction. This is the strength of my heart. Well, I want to develop heart failure. And if you develop heart failure, what's your ejection rejection fraction? You have, you have a completely normal ejection fraction, normal squeeze, and yet to develop heart failure. And I have patients who have terribly low ejection fractions that can still run four miles a day without any problems and without any limitations. So remember that ejection fraction is just a number. But if you compare those patients who have weak hearts to those patients who have strong hearts and heart failure, when women predominate in the group that have strong hearts. In other words, I mean, I, I think a number of you here might, I, I get this analogy all the time, but I, I tell my uh, medical students, that they're probably not going to understand what I'm saying. Uh, you probably all remember the ink droppers we used to use to fill our confidence, and that has a hole. Remember that? And so I, I always ask them this question, is what's more important, to, to suck up the ink into the ink dropper or to drop the ink into the, into the pen? Which part? The pressing of the ball or the releasing of the ball? Which one is more important to fill the pen? Question, right? Yeah, so, um, both are important. If I don't, if, if because both parts are important for the pen, right? You release the ball and sucks up the ink, you press the ball and you release the ink. If one or the other is faulty, how are you going to fill that pump? It's the same thing with the heart. The heart muscle is exactly like the ball on that, right? Because the squeeze pushes out the blood, it relaxes, sucks in the blood. And unless it sucks in the blood, it's not going to be able to push out the blood. If it sucks in very little, it's going to push out very little. 
right? So, so the squeeze is what causes systolic function to strengthen the heart, and the relax is what we call diastolic function, the relaxation function of the heart. All right. So heart women tend to have more diastolic heart rate. The squeeze is not bad, but the relax function is impaired. Um, and even after having heart attacks, we tend to have more heart failure, more heart failure with strong hearts, and women tend to be on less therapy, less medications to treat their heart failure. Some of it may be self-imposed, and some of it may be, may be the fact that they're not followed as aggressively, but whatever be the reasons. And when we look at women with the heart failure, you can see that as the years have gone on, we've been discharging more and more and more women with heart failure. Next, please. And as you have women at blockage in their coronary arteries and heart failure, they are the group that have the worst survival. Women with coronary disease and heart failure, compared to women with no coronary disease, men with no, no coronary disease and heart failure, men with coronary disease and heart failure, look at the group with the worst survival. It's still women with the heart disease and heart failure. Next, please. So primary prevention guidelines, what is primary prevention? It's preventing the disease before it happens. So these are things that we want to, to emphasize before the disease sets in. And that is focus on a low salt diet, focus on a healthy diet, avoid hormonal contraceptives if you can, avoid causal hormone therapy if you can. Um, as far as diabetes, it increases your risk of uh, heart and vascular disease. And um, cardio protection is reduced, even even your premenopause if you are diabetic. And, and, and this is the other point: is that we measure blood sugars in diabetics because it's the easiest thing for us to measure. We have a means of measuring blood sugar. But what is the target organ? What is the organ that's affected by diabetes? Can you hear me? Pancreas. Yeah, it's, it's pancreas. It's an efficiency in producing the hormone that starts off diabetes. But what is the what are the organs that are affected at the end of the day? What are some of the ill effects that diabetics suffer from? Heart disease, vascular disease, eye problems, kidney problems, limb loss. But really, what is happening? The target organ that the diabetes is affecting is actually the blood vessel. The blood vessel becomes diseased for diabetics. And where is this blood vessel that gets diseased in a diabetic? Going all over the body. So it ravages the blood vessels. And that's the reason why these patients end up getting all these kinds of problems downstream. Um, third thing in primary prevention is if it is cholesterol. And um, women are less likely to receive guideline recommended statin therapy. But, but I see this all the time too is that we generally tend to seek. Um, um, care a little bit later. We tend to minimize our problems. We have a lot of heartache. We're running out. We've got 10 minutes to do, right? And then to go get that cholesterol tested is probably the last thing on my to do list, right? So, so we tend to wait. And then when that happens, I also, the data suggests that we are more likely to decline standard therapy for whatever reason. Um, and there was recently a paper that was published that actually said that. The um, statin tolerance is thought to exist much, much, much more commonly than it actually does. In other words, um, when we take a statin to the cholesterol medicine, if we have ache or pain, we tend to say, oh, that must be that must be the muscle ache is from the statin. Whereas um, the, 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 the European trials suggested that up to 95% of patients will tolerate the statin without any problems. Um, we just need to push it, change the statin, change the doses. There's things we can do. So, uh, and women are less likely to continue that statin even if they're prescribed, but realize that there is benefit to taking care of that cholesterol, both from primary prevention standpoint, meaning to prevent the disease from the get go, and secondary prevention, which is to take care of the disease after it has set in. Um, and women uh, complain of muscle aches more than men, and therefore the statin is changed often, the dosing is changed often, and because of these frequent changes, we cannot get them to where they need to go in terms of getting to the optimal cholesterol. So this is something I would encourage all of you to do. It's easy, it's online, it's available to all of you, okay? Um, this is called the ASCPD risk score, or the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk score, okay? Um, and I'd like to point out a few things. It, it, 
Look at what it goes through. It goes through your age and gender, um, your race, your cholesterol numbers, blood pressure numbers, and your treatment for blood pressure, diabetes, and of course. Okay, if you plug in these numbers, what it's going to spit out is it's going to tell you what your 10 year risk of having a heart attack is. Cardiovascular disease, heart and strokes, and major cardiovascular events. So it will give you a 10 year risk. We used to use family members for the old days. This is, a, this is a newer version. And there's also something called risk enhancers that I pointed out to earlier. Of those people who have rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, family history, South Asian ancestry, cruelty, um, and all of that, all those things would be risk enhancers, meaning that even when you have the calculator says, oh, your risk is 2%. Well, take a grain of salt, pause, you're of South Asian descent and have a family history of patients. So that's what that means. So individualize the treatment. So when you have a discussion with your doctor, they might say, hey, your tenure risk is 2%. But you have these other risk factors. What do you think? Do you think that that's what we call shared decision making? We would talk to the patient and say, well, this is 2%, but you have these other enhancers of risk. So, what do you think about taking the cholesterol medicine to lower your risk? And that's a conversation with your physician. Right now, the guideline recommends that the, the percentage risk, the tenure risk, comes out to be anywhere about 7.5%. Between 75 and 20%, we will have a conversation and say, hey, I think you're going to benefit from going on a step of cholesterol medicine. But if over 20%, you obviously better. But notice that it does not include have you had angiogram, it does not include have you had a stress test, it does not include have you had an echocardiogram, because none of those things predict your risk of heart disease stuff. None. I, and I say this all the time you have a stress test today and a heart attack tomorrow, and angiogram today and a heart attack tomorrow. None of those things can be your risk of heart These are the things that can be So um, statins for uh, ASCPD prevention, this is what I just went through. Uh, um, so obviously, for, for primary prevention, that is to stop the disease if you have a bad cholesterol. Remember, L for lousy is for happy. So if your lousy cholesterol, LDL that number is over 190, we will treat you. Um, because you will benefit if you're diabetic. Um, if you're between 40 and 75 years of age, and that ASCBD risk score that I went through, if you're you calculated out to have more than 20% risk, or if you have um, a, a risk between 7.5 and 20% and you have risk enhancers, these are all patients that would say should go on step. And secondary prevention is obviously those who already have disease. Um, who do you not treat? Um, those patients who are the lowest, they're less than 5% risk, they're young. Premenopausal or pregnant or intending to get pregnant within the next few months, we will not treat that. Um, the maybe is the gray zone, and that is when they have risks between five and seven and a half percent, but they have these other risks that I spoke about. Um, and, and then you have a discussion with the physician. Um, and while we're, we're on this point, sometimes I and I do this a lot, is I might say, hey, you have these other risk enhancers, why don't we do something called coronary casting score? And a calcium score CT is basically a CAT scan, an autopass CAT scan, the chest it takes 30 seconds to do. And it tells you whether there's calcium buildup in the arteries of the heart. And why is calcium important? And if you go back, um, you've heard the old term of hardening of the arteries. And the hardening of the arteries was a term that came about because they noticed in those days that those arteries were be like and hard, and they were hard because of the calcium in those arteries. So when the um, when cholesterol builds up in the arteries, it gets coated over with calcium. Calcium is a mineral. And, uh, and teleologically, if you think about it, I think it was nature's way of protecting us from a heart attack. So when the, uh, when the cholesterol hardens, it doesn't break. And if it doesn't break, you have less risk of a heart attack. You might have chest pain, but you have less risk of a heart attack. It's when you have a jiggly cholesterol in the arteries that breaks and you get a heart attack. So um, that's what we call hardening of the arteries. So when you look at CAT scan, you look at, and you see coronary calcium, that coronary calcium is a surrogate marker for um, atherosclerosis, in other words, cholesterol buildup in those arteries. And then you might say, you know, I already see some cholesterol buildup in those arteries. And I wish that you too any differently with somebody that doesn't have heart disease and wait for a heart attack to treat your cholesterol. That's the case to treat it sooner. So that may be another what we call risk enhancer that we might use to sort of sway the equation one way or another. Um, aspirin 
And I know that this is the, uh, there's been a lot of talk about aspirin um, these days. So the, the answer is, is um, fairly simple. If you, have, if you have heart disease, if you have vascular disease, whether it's in the legs, it's in the stroke, it's whatever it is, um, you're going to take an aspirin. When are you not going to take an aspirin? Um, those who had uh, prior bleeding, but no known cardiovascular disease, and healthy women with no major risk factors, and routine use just for primary prevention in somebody who's over seven years of age. There's nobody that say that you benefit. I always have patients say that, yeah, you're going to have a few. Uh, is there, is there, is there, is there, there's some benefit in terms of strokes and heart attacks? Yes. But what is it offset by? It's offset by increased risk of bleeding. So that's where we have everything in medicine. Everything we do in medicine is like the skin benefit, it's the balance, which, which side of that balance tilts. Um, so this is the group where the balance does not tilt in favor of aspirin. But again, we have a gray zone. Somebody who's a smoker, somebody who's got a strong family history, somebody who's got an elevated coronary calcium score that we just spoke about. And, and lipids that are very high cholesterol, which is very high blood pressure that's very high, with a very high risk score, and a low risk of bleeding. I'm going to tell you, I don't know about the aspirin. And a baby aspirin is enough. From a cardiovascular disease prevention standpoint, there's no data to say that anything more than a baby aspirin does any more. There's an increased risk of bleeding without um, a subsequent a decrease in risk of cardiovascular. So uh, all this while we spoke about mostly coronary disease, blockage of the arteries, traditional and non-traditional risk factors for developing those conditions. But there's some other conditions that are not associated with blockages of coronary arteries, and those predominate in women. And the first one is the broken heart syndrome. Is there any heard of this? Also called takotsubo. And you know what takotsubo is? Um, takotsubo is a Japanese word for an octopus trap. And uh, basically, the octopus straps it with this set of pot um, with kind of narrow mouth and um, kind of a broader base. This is what it looks like the pot with a narrow neck and a um, broader base. And that's when you use to the trap the octopus. And the heart looks like that when you do an angina and look at it on angina, which is why it's called um, tapo sumo, or the broken heart syndrome, was what the New England Journal called it when they published the article. And basically, what happens is that the heart weakens, but a, a lot of the time, because of an intense physical or emotional stress, and you might see it when somebody's lost a loved one or there's been um, a traumatic experience in their life, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the good news is it's transient, meaning to say that it happens when it happens, patients get very, very sick. But if you put them appropriate therapy and take good care of them, the heart recovers. Um, and this was uh, the paper that's published in Jack about this, but this is what I wanted to point out. Look at women and men, and look at age groups. We're going from age 30 to age 90. The vast majority of patients we talked to were actually women. Vast majority, by far and away, it's women. Okay. And this is another one. This is called scatting. You know this? That is spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And if you look at women who present with heart attacks younger than the age of 55, SCAD accounts for about a third of all the heart attacks. And what that is, is this is different than a traditional heart attack. And what is a traditional heart attack? Like I told you, there's a genuine plaque in the artery. The artery, if I did an angiogram today, I think it's only 40% blocked. But that jiggly cholesterol is not stable. It's unstable cholesterol. So it breaks, just like if you have a blob of, um, of fat, you drop it on a surface. What happens if you took that surface, that blob of fat is going to move, or it, it might just fall off that surface. The same thing happens to this jiggly cholesterol. It breaks from the wall of the artery for this inflammation. And then, with it, and then what happens is that the body says, oh, there's something happening here, and I need to protect from injury. And what does the body normally do to protect from injury? It forms a blood clot. So it goes there and it clots. So we have cholesterol and clot that come together to close the artery. That's a heart attack, right? So that's how a heart attack happens. Now, um, this is a very different process. Here, the artery tears. The, the tear can extend along the entire length of the muscle. Or it could, it, it, it could only be in a, in a part of the vessel, like here, and there's blood that collects within the wall of the artery. And just that collection of blood in the wall of the artery will then narrow the lumen of the artery. 
and then restrict the flow of blood through the artery. This is called a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And by far and away, women predominate with this as well. So this is what we call an intramural hematoma. The vessel tears, and when the vessel tears, blood extravasates into that, into that tear, and as the blood extravasates more and more, it compresses the lumen, which is the, the, the central pipe, and therefore, there's less, less blood flowing through it, and by constricted to such an extent that the artery itself might close. This is SCAD. This is a heart attack. So this is where you have that jiggly cholesterol. There's breaks in that cholesterol, and then blood comes in there. The place, let's say, all oh, this injury that you form a clot, and you want to hold your blood clot in your So And the last condition I wanted to cover is atrial fibrillation. Um, everybody familiar with this? So AFib is the most common heart rhythm in the service of the center in the US. And um, the big thing with AFib, the way I um, this is the normal heart rhythm, this is AFib. Um, this is the upper chamber, what we call the atrium, the lower chamber, what we call the ventricle. And normally, the normal squeeze function of the heart is the upper chamber squeezes the blood into the lower chamber. The lower chamber squeezes the blood out to the rest of the body. And that happens in tandem. One after the other, upper chamber goes, lower chamber goes, upper chamber, lower chamber, and they go in tandem. That's the normal pumping function of the heart. And therefore, as you can imagine, that squeeze, that push of blood, uh, to that bringing out of blood from that top chamber is important to keep that upper chamber clean and healthy. And also important to add that extra little bit of blood that will fill that lower chamber. Right? You're sucking in a little bit more blood into that pumping chamber. What happens in AFib is that the upper chamber doesn't squeeze anymore. It quivers. Uh, it's kind of just doing this. It's just doing its own chaotic rhythm there and it's just going like that without that squeeze. So anytime you don't have that squeeze, what happens to the blood? Blood stagnates there. And blood stagnates anywhere, what happens? The blood clot, right? If you leave, if you if there's blood somewhere that's still, you might have a wild clot. So, so it forms a blood clot. So you can form a blood clot in this upper chamber because it's not squeezing the blood out. So the blood clots inside the heart, it won't stay in the heart because the heart, the heart's in constant state of motion. So it's going to travel the bloodstream slowly and slowly down into the ventricle and then out the aorta somewhere into the body. It will float off the circulation somewhere. Because the brain that is broken, it goes to the belly, it cuts off the circulation, the belly of the hands or the legs, and wherever it cuts off the circulation, it will cause any cancer. So this is the reason why we put people who have AFib on blood thinners. Um, is to prevent, this is what we call thrombo, embolism, thrombo meaning clot, embolism meaning the clot that floats away. So thrombo embolism, right? So this is why we put patients with AFib on blood thinners. But we don't put everybody on blood thinners. So we do a calculation and say, okay, so who are the people, again, like I said, I mean, in medicine is about that balance. Which side does that balance tilt, right? So blood thinners, if you hit yourself, if you yourself if you fall and you can bleed more because we're getting your blood two times as much as everybody else so you're going to bleed more than others and um on the other hand we can help to prevent the blood clot so who are those people that would benefit and so we do a calculation to say that you have more than two risk factors and out of that it's it, it's it's no um no rocket science we call it a chad's vast score meaning you have the, and the chad's vast is ehads and vast the C stands for congestive heart failure, age is hypertension, age is uh, A, which is over 65 and 65 to 75 and 75 or above, diabetes, previous strokes, and heart and vascular disease stands for the best. And we have one more risk factor, which is not included here, and that is female sex. In other words, you might have, so if we say that you have a risk factor, if you have a chance that's four of more than two, you will benefit from going on blood thinners. But just by virtue of being a woman, you have a score of one. Even if you don't have the disregard that you are hypertension or diabetes or whatever, by, by virtue of being a woman, you have a score of one. Why? Because women are known to have more strokes to live with. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind. We have more strokes, more disabling strokes with atrial fibrillation, and um, and and I highlighted that in the video. That is more awesome. sense. Um, and the chads vast I went through with you was in this heart failure, hypertension, age, diabetes, previous strokes, vascular disease, whether it's in your heart or your 
um, or your legs or your your and so on and, and, and add to that. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Sorry. So, what can you do? And this is what just to make it easy for people to remember, um, AIJ came out with this, it's called Life Simple Seven, which is basically control your risk factors and start early. And that is raise your HDL, lower your LDL. This is remember, I said H4 happy health allows you. So, high happy and a low lousy is a way to go. So, control your cholesterol, um, check your sugars, make sure you. Don't live on diabetic and people keep it controlled. Eat healthy, keep a healthy weight, exercise, don't smoke, and check your blood pressure and keep that blood pressure controlled. Um, and blood pressure control is adding on green that and there, are, and there are exceptions to the rule and so on, but in general, at least bring it down at 140 or 90. Um, and um, and, and some supplements you want much shorter than that as well, but I won't go into specifics. Um, this is again that ASC risk score that I was talking about, but I, mean, I just plugged in some numbers here. But it's nice to kind of mess around with this tool that you all go on this website, the one that I showed you, see this calculated for people they want to use. This is ACC's calculated for all the same, um, but mess around with it. Um, change that blood pressure from 110, change it to 140 and see what happens to the number. Change the total cholesterol from 200, change it to 150 and see what happens to your risk. And you see, that messing around with those numbers changes that 10 year risk by a lot. Uh, by a lot. And if I shift your risk from being in that less than 7.5% 7, 7 to over 7.5%, just simply by virtue of saying, um, you know, your, your cholesterol went from 2.50, my lower group into a completely different risk group. So play around with it just, just to get an idea of how it works. Um, this is just uh, another schematic that says it's, we don't just talk about these traditional risk factors. We also want to know what are your other risk factors that you had uh, endometriosis, hypothesis, ovaries, and pregnancy loss, and, and other pregnancy, adverse pregnancy outcomes. Tell us about all that when we're making the decision to treat your cholesterol, to treat your sugar, and so on and so forth. And in certain populations, consider a coronary artery test. Or in that might be something else to discuss, especially if you belong to the group where you're talking to your, your doctors, like, oh, I think you should go on a statin. You're like, no, I don't want to go on a statin. And then, then you know, sometimes this serves as a type. Of it. So, we'll, um, before we end, so women are faced, so things I want you to remember is that we are faced with many unique cardiovascular risks over, about, and beyond the risks that men have. Um, and these risks start for us during the reproductive years, and adverse pregnancy outcomes can lead to increased cardiovascular disease or risk downstream. Um, certain gynecological conditions will also increase cardiovascular risk. Age and menopause is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. In other words, those who attain menopause early are at increased risk. Um, so know your risk and be informed, and take control. Remember, life simple seven. And, um, have a discussion with, with, your, with your doctors, and um, and that if you if, if you know of anybody in your life that's young enough to have a pregnancy with children and things like that, lactation is very important, and that benefit outlasts pregnancy preparedness and, and so on. So um, this is a, this is a, a benefit that lasts throughout the, the, the lifetime. So just just remember that, and, and if you can influence others into breastfeeding, please do it. Stop. Is it true that uh, parasites or viruses can take residency in your heart? Yeah, they can. Yeah, there's uh, there's entities called viral myocarditis, which is like an inflammatory process that can set up the heart. You can have um so yes, so viral myocarditis is something that exists and it can be weak in the heart and so on. So yes, I I didn't go into the other aspects of what you mean, but yes, you can have a viral myocarditis. Um, and there's also parasitic infections that can affect, especially um, in tropical countries. Um, uh, you know, so you have high and so on can happen in the heart. You've seen that first. Is there a good thing that's not like spiral Um, um, from Lyme disease that yeah, Lyme disease and Yeah, Lyme disease or MCD regards and indefinitely and show up later. Yeah, so Lyme disease can affect the heart. 
in, in many ways, you can get carbon block, there's um, many different manifestations. So there's, there's several of those conditions that we have. Yes, that is true. So the beneficial for someone like that um, long term um, well, it, it depends on is it just a suspicion or have they found it already? Because most of these patients who have, um, you know, a viral myocarditis will present with pulmonary heart failure a lot of the times, but it will present with symptoms of congestive heart failure, and that's how it's picked up most of the time. Um, and um, so, also with Lyme disease, they present a lot of the times with heart block, meaning their heart doesn't beat properly, it skips beats, and when they start. Wondering why that's happening, you work it out by methods. So there's several several of those conditions that are um, that are unrelated to uh, those factors and things like that. That those are completely separate to the best conditions. I mean, I think because my my daughter as a child had full-blown lung cancer, so I think that that's part of it. Yeah, but now it's many years later. The electrophysiologists are the people who would evaluate um, that consistency. Um, so uh, they probably did heart monitors and things like that, but not the only details it's hard to find. But generally, they would have done work up for it, especially if they know about the history line. Um, the, the standard standard work up with it. You should put that in the Yeah, and then what about the same works? Where would you go back to? You can go back to the same cardiologist or, and have, have a discussion of symptoms of the system and they can see what you do with the system. How does scar tissue affect heart cells? Many different ways. Um, you, can, you can develop scar when you have heart attack, and which is why we say that time is muscle. Um, so when somebody has a heart attack, we want you to present really quickly. Um, because the longer that heart stays without blood flow, it damages, irreversibly damages the myocytes, meaning the cells of the heart. It's just like in a stroke, when somebody has a stroke, we want you to come really quickly, because then we, we can take care of it. We can cut the artery, similar to the heart. If, if there's loss of blood flow, we want to reestablish that blood flow as quickly as we can, because if we don't, that irreversibly scars down the heart muscle. It's the most common cause. There's other entities like um, myocarditis and so on and so forth that can also cause scarring and cellulosis. There's other, several other conditions that cause scarring, most common being heart attack. So, scarring can't be If it's completely scarred, we cannot heal it. And there's different, there's different varieties. There's something called stunning of the myocardium, there's something called hibernation of the myocardium, and then there's scarring of the myocardium. So stunning and hibernation are two ways in which the heart weakens, but there's potential to re-strengthen it again. But when it's scarred, meaning the muscle is dead, then we cannot strengthen it back again. Okay, the Neurologist, but uh, not, not when somebody has a TIA. Uh, the TIA workup is to see did you have a mini stroke? And I'll be seeing evidence of a mini stroke on a, a CT scan or MRI. Um, and if there's lingering effects after that, or if there's new symptoms after that, the neurologist will take over and um, evaluate that. And there's CT The neurologist will make that determination usually as, as to what would be the most effective test to do. Um, but the first test that's usually done is a CT because it's quick. Yeah. The emergency room can get it in a second, and then they can know what's going on. And then the neurologist, based on their exam, will decide whether or not she took the damage of the MRI. Is required. Well, the question of that means to go back to the neurologist. 
the neurologists are the ones, yeah, the neurologists are the ones who the, the TIA is basically a new mm, TIA is, no, the TIA by definition is transient. That's what the T stands for. The transient is being attacked at an event and it goes away. That's what the TIA is. Down, downstream, if somebody develops you know, a dementia type illness, that could be because of many other events like TIA. We mentioned to it's not even a neurologist, uh, but it would be a good question for a neurologist to to. Sometimes you can't. That's where medicine can have that sense. you mean? PDC, no, completely different. A PDC is a premature ventricular contraction. In other words, it's an extra bleed that comes a little early originating from the bottom of the heart. A fib is the heart of the rhythm disturbance that happens at the top of the heart, completely different. There's many different rhythm disorders. I did not touch upon all of them. I only spoke about A fib because of the fact that we didn't have more strokes with it and because of the, of the topic I touched upon A fib for that reason. But B and C are completely different. So, the there are circumstances where we would have laid PVCs, yes. Um, and and uh, we would have laid PVCs in everybody. We see diagnosis and PVCs every day in our practices. But there are certain subgroups of patients who will benefit from ablation, yes. Those companies that advertise um, coming in for two weeks, current checkup, you know, they do all the stuff, put all the hard hands, and something's going to happen. Like an all in one, just so much money, something going to happen. Oh, like a screening test. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Would that be, um, what was your you know, other option versus, you know, that instead of just Going to the cardiologist to get a full checkup and workup or what a primary can do in five minutes, you know. Um, but the, the, the screen that you're referring to is in the they do a quick screening exam. Um, and it's not required in everybody, which is the reason why if somebody chooses to do what they can, uh, and that's just for your own um, you know. You want to figure it out, you want to see what's going on, they want to get the test, yes, you can. But generally, what we do is when you come in to see a cardiologist, if there's symptoms, we do order testing. We generally do not order testing in symptomatic patients, which is why some things are really interested in getting um, one of those what they call lifeline uh, screenings or something like that. I and mean, you can go ahead and do that, but there's there's no data that we've um, gathered to say that you know we should recommend that in a general population setting. It's discretionary. You can, yeah, and it's discretionary. And we've seen sometimes that we get results from there that we don't further testing, which may or may not be required. Um, so it, it's, it's a discretionary thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 